Hi, my name is Nicole Scarcelli. I am a registered nurse. Um, I am also a retired military officer. I served in the United States Navy for six years um, as an intelligence officer and also as the assistant to a commander. Um, my story is one of addiction, revisiting me every time uh, some big series of plans uh, doesn't work out. So um, I've learned that um, that personally for me, um, I when I when something big doesn't work out, I do something big like go homeless, and that is why I'm here. Period. Um, I am a registered nurse. Um, I've also uh, am a veteran. I have served in the United States Navy for six years. Hoorah! And thank you, veterans, for all your service. It's important that you know that. Um, I was an assistant to a commander. One of the two uh, commanders tend to have two assistants: one uh, shipboard, one uh, one on the ship, and one stateside on the ground on the land. Uh, studied at the office. So if uh, my verbiage is not perfect right now, which it usually is in a professional setting, he grabbed me off the street. And I was running and running around, and it's hot out here. So have a nice day about that. So um, my duties in the military aren't as uh, aren't, sir, aren't in combat service as most are, um, most forces are. I was not enlisted, I was an officer um, because of my medical condition pre existing um, that I had. Uh, I could not be a combat service veteran, uh, off, uh, a soldier. Um, so I was very happy to serve my country in any way that I could. Um, my story is that I've always been, people that are addicts tend to do one of two things. And that is one, they tend to be up or they like to be down. So you're an up or a down person. And uh, we're talking about drank and, and being a zombie and, and, and passing on on the sidewalk versus being uh, high, endorphined up, excited to be alive and out with your friends, you're, you're charismatic. It's, you know, it's make the drug is making you more uh, friendly. It's making you more outgoing. It's taking away those tears, the frustrations, the day. You don't gotta worry about those damn semester tests or the boards in school or the tests in school or anything. Y'all going out with your friends. We all love doing it. It is part of our culture. It is part of our way of life, and it is a rite of passage to be able to do such things. And I am saying it is a rite of passage to indulge in drugs. You're damn right it is. We're Americans, and uh, we're also humans, and while I agree with some of the constrictions placed on it by our governments and our law, I also agree that um, it is our free will and free right to indulge in the things that we love to do. At our discretion, and hopefully you use discretion, but of course not all of us do, as we all know. And. Um, <coughs> You know, you also need to, you're going to learn, and we all know this as addicts, I don't have to tell you, but I will bring this to light. Um, one of the things I want to do is, is, is bring all of this to light, this, this subculture here, why I came here, why the people are here, um, and uh, why it's important now, today. And believe me, I didn't just wake up one day and think that I was an expert. I have been observing things for a very long time, from very different perspectives in, in my various roles that I am most grateful and humble and and and, and in God's name am I glad for everything that I've been able to do in my life education and etc and uh, I have been um, upper middle class you know I know I was privileged I understand that uh, I also worked damn fucking hard for everything that I have I got good grades, I became an athlete, I uh, did the PT requirements, I practiced those for a year because ROTC rejected me right away uh, for my club foot, which the irony of the club foot, and I'll get to this in addiction all, um, in a minute here. See, I'm, I'm describing this girl who's going, going, she's a girl who goes, who's getting stuff done, she's going and going and going. She's gonna go do this, and she's gonna get it done. She's gonna go do that. She's gonna get it done. She's gonna go join that team because she wants. She learned. She figured out she loved to run at eight years old, like run, like run, 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 like a runner, runner, run, that kind of run. Figured out she loved to swim at six years old, like swimmer, swim, swim, swim. You know. So you know, and I am, 
using me as a representation for a type of person, uh, an uppity kind of a person and things like that. And okay, so if you're not following by, I'm, I'm going to give you a quick insight. Quick insight to, to Layman. My comparisons are this. I Drugs are up and down people. So I'm describing an up person and a typical up person. Uh, such as myself, a boy or a girl in school or, you know, joining sports, doing this, doing that, accomplishing this, accomplishing that. They're going, they're going, they're going. They're, they're the people that rise and shine. They get out. They Very rarely do parents have to tell them to get up and get going because they're just that kind of people to begin with. And, of course, as mothers and fathers, we probably go think, oh, my kid is like that. Excuse me, father. I'm sorry. Um, I'm an addict. I've been an addict. Um, I noticed. I only. I found out I was an addict when I was 29 years old. Um, by and large, um, I just smoked um, a little bit of pot in high school. I went to a boarding school, so I even. I only even did that when we came home for Christmas break, and all ten of my brothers, seven of my brothers, were in the basement, and their friends, and we'd all be hanging out. My sister and everything. You know, that's it. That's it for the drugs until 29. Okay, so there it is. But as far as addiction goes. I was addicted to sports, the endorphins, but I love them. But I also knew I was uh, i was always moving, rollerblading, skiing, running, did it on top of school and work and the military. So I served six years. Um, I retired veteran, uh, United States Navy. I was an intelligence officer. Um, I also was an assistant to a commander, and those were my jobs. I was an officer, not enlisted. Um, my stress levels were high. And I had to be responsible for some very serious decisions um, involving our men and women. Um, and the women, women, uh, by comparison, the men and women's stress levels were, am I going to get killed today? And am I going to have PTSD? Or am I going to come out with one over one leg? I understand. So from that, just that aspect, they have their addictions. From mine, I have mine. And so, you know, perspective is everything. Um, how I got to Kensington, um, I, after my education, I was a double major in journalism and biochemistry. Um, I got to Kensington because it was really hard, career-wise, to keep things moving financially. And and for everybody, not just myself, it, it, is, it, is a, it is a struggle to keep up your lifestyle and to fight for it and to be proud and, and every day. So, you know, there's something to be said for the people that rise and shine and hustle and move, you know, and to the best of their ability. There's also something to be said for people who sit on their butts on the sidewalk against the wall all day or at home in front of the TV. Whether you're homeless, as I said first, or at home, it doesn't matter. So how I got to Kensington is this. Um, I uh, became a registered nurse. Yes, I know, right? I did 11 years hard time. Ha ha. I meant, I meant school, not jail. And I became a registered nurse in 2014 because um, I love people and I love helping people and I wanted to put uh, my writing skills because I majored in journalism and biochem and I've been a writer for 30 years, a freelance writer. I've been that for 30 years. Um, so I don't do everything full time, but um, I put my full effort into everything. So I got my nursing degree and, uh, you know, and I was very proud of that. I thought I was done school. I did it when I was raising a baby as a single mother. Um, and I did it while working three part-time jobs. You know, so I'm very proud of myself and my hard work. Um, I'm not here to pat myself on the back. I'm here to tell you how I got here. How I got here was they changed the education requirements for nurses. So they decided to stand up one day all of a sudden. Because, you know, we're not like middle-aged with kids running around as soccer moms, working full-time jobs. As nurses who, by a subheading, we run around like chickens without a head all day on our shift on top of the whole day being soccer mama and cooking and cleaning and, you know, et cetera and all that stuff. Not that we don't love our lives, we do, but, you know, that's just me and what I do. And I know other people have different stories and come with different things and I can't speak for them. I, um, t I did up at Kensington because when I found out I had, uh, they were changing the education requirements for nurses to not, to be able to hold just an associate's degree, RN anymore. Um, our ends are associates degree two years. Um, they want you to be a bachelor's for insurance purposes and you know that's just a big deal now. All states are doing it, all hospitals are doing it. You will lose your job, your livelihood, possibly your mortgage, your car, and your van and you have your kids. And I'm not trying to scare nobody but yeah that is all in the light of day. You know and whether or not then you're gonna have to make decisions should I buy IC or milk, I hand buy both. 
that's the road you're heading down. So um, I, it drove me back into my addiction um, for the second time. It was the ma ma big, um, for me personally, I learned that about myself. Massive letdowns about my plans make me go hit the, um, hit my drugs. They, they, uh, they drive me right to my drugs because I am not a person who likes to not have things work out. I plan, I make sure, you know, I, 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 I budget money and I budget time and I budget myself and my sanity. I budget everything um, to uh, make that happen. And I do it with love and, and excitement and, and, and uh, God's will. Um, I am here because I chose to become here on purpose when I knew that uh, we, I was going to lose my job because I had just spent 10 years obtaining my nursing degree working part-time jobs. I had to take a few classes at a time to get there. I just broke it up so I got straight A's and I did it and that's how I did it. I could not go another two or three years. That I couldn't do it. That's what they were asking of us. You know, we're going to grandfather you in, but you got to study another couple of years, and you got to work full time while you do it. But you got to pay for the class up front, and we'll give you tuition reimbursement if you get an A. But make sure the kids' noses aren't running and they don't have fevers on top of all of that, because God forbid if that happens, you have to drive them to work and you're late. You know, nurse managers don't like that. So these are kinds of things that you have to. That, this is all the stress that drove me to become down to Kenzie's. Um, I found out about it through uh, somebody I got high with one time. And here I am. Um, the first time I learned I was an addict, I was 29 years old, um, and I was let go from the military, from the job that I loved and worked so hard for. Um, I lost my career for the first time. My nursing career was my second career loss. These are the reasons why I came to Kensington. It was devastating to me. Devastating to me. I couldn't handle it. It was everything. It just made my life like just a mess. So the first time was when they revoked the medical waivers that kept me in the military. The second time was when they said you got to work even harder and go a little bit longer with school because you can't stay here. If you do. So you know it's like well fuck you too. I mean really you know you just wake up and you're like sitting on the floor like the nurse manager calls we're all on the floor working we're all like the people or the patients are yelling at you and then you're doing and he like stops you in the hallway hey by the way Head medicine said you all got to get your BSNG. You have two years to do it. Everybody gather around. Hurry up, hurry up. This is you got to get two years to do it. Here's your sheets. Here's your tuition classes. Here's the payment. Here's how much it costs. Here's how you get reimbursed. You need it all done by this time frame. And here's the time frames for each of you individually. Go talk to your your uh, guidance counselors about what classes you need and what classes you have and how you can figure that all out. Have a nice day. Bye. Hope it didn't add to your stress. Yeah. So. I came down here, um, then I had a dream. God said, uh, Nicole, I want you to go use the talents I gave you, and I want you to tell the story. I want you to um, go and use your loving compassion and also your talent and your nursing medical abilities to go down there and write this story and your 30 years of experience as a writer. Um, the Lord did come to me in a dream. If you're a Christian, you might understand that. I'm a Christian, I believe it. Um, and he told me to come here, and I never would have done that ever in my life, but Kensington Hill, are you crazy? Ew. No way, I live in Westchester. You know? But I did, and I gave my brother power of attorney over my accounts. When I came here broken homeless, to write about this as a journalist and to experience it broken homeless. So I had two parts to it. One was to write a feature story that I got asked to do for the editor of Pittsburgh Post Gazette, which I've been, uh, it's gonna be a great story. The other reason is because I lost my job and my career. The, the re one reason was a professional, the other reason was personal. I had, did not want to pay any more rent or mortgage at all. I couldn't do it. I was burnt out. What they just told me just took every last ounce of everything I had in myself, inside of me. Um, everything I gave every day with my autistic child, raising him and taking classes and going to work and picking him up and, and studying and doing all the timing. and. and and uh, you know the criticisms along the way and the frustration and I did not get high for 18 years uh, I didn't know I was an addict until I was 29 I was out of the party I did some coke I did some coke a little bit of you know by and large I didn't do many drugs early on in my in my life I was fortunate like that and I know most of us aren't and I understand that that's another story to go in depth more depth later uh, my article will address that by the way um, which will be printed in the fall and uh, so, you know, I just told my son's father, take our son, he's 16 now, uh, go to, go, we're going we're gonna to voluntarily get rid of our house, um, we're going to put everything in storage, 
you know, we're going to face this head on, you know. And uh, before I said those words to him, he, and not my son, <laughs> he, Bob, uh, what is my son? Anyway, it was watching me get high. I would started getting, after, I started getting high again uh, nine months after I actually had to step away from my job. It took me about, I, I was strong for nine or ten months. Yes, I went back to being a paralegal. That was not a problem. Um, yes, there are a billion other things I do for money that I created for myself. That's not a problem. What a problem was was the, the devastation and the hurt and all that time and effort and work I did to, that I put into it for so long. It was just like, to me, it was just thrown in the trash. Like it was nothing. Like my work, okay, you can't stay at Penn Medicine. It was everything to me. It was where I wanted to be and I got there. I did it with straight A's on the Dean's List, with a baby, a little baby on my lap. I literally held that baby and studied. And as he grew, he sat next to me and studied his stuff, because mommy put a little desk right next to her. You know, and these are, things, these are the things that you don't realize people do. And so, you know, we put everything in storage, we packed up the house, we faced it head on, and I said, I'm going homeless. He said, what? I said, I just don't want to do, I can't, I can't do one more thing. I am so burnt out. I have given life my everything, you know, and personal matters uh, being addressed here because we're all adults and it's part of the story. Um, his father, I love to pieces. I love him to death. I've never been in love with him, but I knew he's a great man. He's a good man. He's a good father. I picked him because we were, we were friends who decided to have a baby. We were not married as a couple or in love. We were friends who decided to have a baby, and we have been very good friends, and we love each other to death. There is no doubt about it, and I can always count on him. But I have sacrificed my love life for my life. For my life going after everything and that is another reason why I wanted to get high again is because it's like you know I had this thing where okay I'll have a better job where I can I can have a little bit more money where I won't feel like even though I have a trust fund and that's another story you know my trust fund is protected by Vanguard and I can't just and the attorney I can't go to a Mac machine all right people don't be going to hold up my sister or my brother or my 12 nieces and nephews because we're NRA and ain't gonna put up with that shit got it they're gonna fight back but uh, that is, all that aside, you know, um, I worked hard for everything, and uh, when you know, and the money that I was making, gonna make as a nurse, and as a nurse paralegal, which was the next step in my career, and all this went towards my dignity as I was aging to grow in my position the best that I could with what I had to work with. Um, and with dignity and grace, you know, and, and, to, and to have a little more income for all that hard work. So I wouldn't still be at Kmart. Even, even with all these degrees, I'm still at Kmart making decisions about, I can pick two things not for, to pay for. You know, so, um, and yeah, even though I had a trust fund, a little extra money in, in, in Vanguard, protected by a power of attorney, don't come after me. And I know I repeated that. Um, I, I did not take that for granted. That is retirement money. It is money from my son's college. It's not a billion dollars. It's not a million dollars. It is by by the by standards of, of money today. It's 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 a help. It is not. Uh, a, 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 it is not wealth. It is a help. That's it. Okay. It is a great. I'm grateful for that help. It'll help for my retirement. It'll help with his college. It'll help with the car. It'll help with the, it. Does it, those little just ease the ease the pain of everything. That's all. And so uh, I put, um, I gave my brother power of attorney over my accounts. I came to Kensington because I was burnt out. I couldn't do one more thing. I just wanted to be me. I wanted to walk around. I didn't want to think about responsibility. I just couldn't do it. I was burnt out. I was fried. Um, I wanted to get high. I wanted to um, hide, but I wanted to live and I wanted to feel uh, my pain. I wanted to work through it. Um, I didn't want to have to worry about the bills at the end of the month, so I did it on purpose. Um, people think I'm crazy. I thought I was crazy. I'm not crazy. <laughs> um, but honestly, I, I haven't regretted one minute of it. It's been one year and three months. Um, yes, I'm getting ready to leave in the next week, and that is for sure. Um, yes, I was in the shelter for five months. Yes, I got housing. But my addiction is this. Um, I got high every day, and I did so willingly, and I did so uh, wantingly. You know, and, I, and, I, and people are going to put down addicts and say, oh, those are your friends. I love every person. I, I love the friends that I have made here. I love 
them. I wouldn't trade them for the world. I, I, I love the people I've met in my professional life too, but these people, these addicts, we can be ourselves and, and do us and nobody judges you. There's not one fucking comment about where are you going at 4 a.m. I got to beat traffic to get to uh, fucking Cambria before, um, you know, 7.15 hits and I got to hit traffic on the way back. That's, you know what I'm saying? Nobody wants to be talking about this shit to your, your son, your spouse. You don't, want to, you don't want to even want to answer the question. You don't want the question to be asked. You just want it to stop. You know, we don't need to go there no more. It exists, let it go. Just accept it and treat it as like, okay, she's getting up and she's going to sit at the table and have breakfast. Okay, she's going to Kansas City and be homeless because she wants to be free to be an addict and without the responsibilities of finance so she can figure out what kind of devastating uh, emotions drove her back to her addiction. Um, my drug of choice originally was cocaine. I can, I can do the entire imported product of Colombia, all the shipments into the seaports on the East Coast. 20 years ago, 25 years ago, I could have done all that, I promise you, and I would have been fine with it because I'm an endurance athlete, my heart could handle it, um, which I know most people couldn't. Um, so cocaine, 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 I loved my cocaine. Um, that uh, turned into meth. When I came to Kensington, I've never done meth before. I came to Kensington, which was a year and three months ago, uh, as of this date today. And right now, don't ask me what it is, because in Kensington, sometimes we forget these things uh, because of the drugs that we're using every day. Um, and because we just decide that we don't want to do that. We don't want to, we don't want to remember. We just want to be. And so um, my, also my drug of choice uh, was brown heroin. That wasn't a choice. Um, I wanted to see what it was like. I managed to uh, say no to, I said no to drugs. I said no to, no, I said no to heroin. Uh, proudly, my whole life up until I was 46 years old. I'm proud of that, I am. I'm proud I said no to meth that whole time. Yes, granted, I had a very structured life, but those are my drugs of choice. Uh, the heroin turned to fentanyl, okay? Fentanyl, very similar, very same highs. I liked them. Yeah, so uh, once I discovered fentanyl, um, I, did, I stopped doing brown dough, brown heroin. Um, I prefer the fentanyl. The, um, for me, and I believe by and large, and also as a nurse, medically speaking, I believe it's my professional opinion as, and my personal one, that the dope sickness for fentanyl is not as great. That is, it is lessened compared to brown dope. I find that to be a fact. Now that is my um, educated guess fact, but there it is and that's me. So, um, Suboxins are great. Um, I got rid of, uh, I stopped using cocaine and crack. Um, the, uh, they no longer were, have been my drug of choice at all. I've, I've not used those two drugs for a year and a half since I've been, since the second week I've been here. So, uh, I definitely, I didn't like the chemicals used in the crack. I didn't like uh, the crack chemicals used in the cocaine. Um, I didn't like the fact that there was hardly any cocaine in either the crack or the cocaine. So, and you can tell it's a pure white, all the additives that are in there. As a biochemistry major, I double majored. Um, I can tell you right now that um, cocaine is an off-white substance um, when cooked, and also uh, it is white normally, but sometimes in certain light it is also off-white. So it is definitely not the same thing, so therefore I stopped using it. It is not the same high. I will gladly cook my own crack, which I can and do. It is off-white. I will smoke that shit and be happy. I will do that today because it is like a woo ringer and we all know with the smoke coming out and everything your ears your auditory nerves are stimulated your eyes are bad you're big and you're like whoa the world just got loud and large and crazy and you're like wow and you're like you get that that is what real coke or crack does when you smoke it you get like it's not the shit that the, and real cocaine you don't feed okay you don't feed the chemicals make you do that so then uh by and large i just came down to two bags a day i use all drugs are per body weight, legal or illegal, it doesn't matter, I don't care. You need, if you're 200 pounds, don't do more than two bags. If you're under 180 pounds, don't do more than one bag. Um, if you're a, a girl like my build, I'm 125, I notice a lot of the young the women out here, a lot of us women out here, I'll gladly stand, I'll gladly stand, here we are. This is for body weight for drugs, okay? So, you know, I was, I lost 50 pounds in the time that I've been here. My boobs are usually this big, yes I have pictures. Closed and unclosed, uh, and uh, no, you can't see it. And 
class, your name is Hustle. And then, um, you know, I had, all, you know, I had a little bit more to me. I had my swimmers, muscles were gone. I have all my thicknesses gone. And, you know, and so I definitely noticed I can't do as many drugs as I did then. I can't handle that. I can't, I cannot handle the amounts I did with 50 times more weight uh, as opposed to, here, I'm gonna show you. It's, it's important, I think it's important that you see what it does to you. Um, and I don't mind this, it was part of the learning experience, you know. Um, I am really depressed about my breast. I know my boyfriend is uh, definitely like a little sad because not all guys are boob guys, but mine is. And I don't mind talking about it as part of what happened to me. I lost the weight. Uh, I can think of 20 women this happened to. It's part of the epidemic. It's part of the opioid crisis. So women, the body structure changes. I know that, and same thing for men. I know these men that have been, were big and strong and virile and had all these muscles and, and, and everything and like biceps and like, their chest. Were, and you know, there are these thin men now. They are whittled down. The body burned that muscle, ate it right up because we didn't eat because we were getting high. Um, your body is pre-programmed to put back what it, what to put back what was taken off when you start eating again. Yes, if you had that genetically and grew into that person, you can get it back. Got it? All right. So, uh, but here, see, I've never been able to count my sternum. Never. See these bones? In my life, never. It, it made me cry. The loss of my breast made me cry. Um, and uh, you know, and it, it's sad. And. Uh, you know, so addiction is a very serious thing. Um, what brought me here is that I wanted a way to deal with my devastation about my career and the plans that I had for me and my family um, and my love life, because I haven't even addressed my love life at almost 50. I'm 47 years old. I was born July 18, 1972. I'm a third generation veteran. Uh, my father um, was in the service and he worked with Agent Orange. I have a club foot, um, hence the medical Hence my need for a medical waiver to get into the military. Funny how the military gave me the injury and then I had to get a waiver to get into the military. It's crazy, right? So anyway, so that's that little bit of story. But, um, you know, all of that's part of it too. Um, it's just, uh, that's part of how I lost my first career was because of the, the, the my physical defects. Um, by the way, I was one of 15,000 the military took, uh, revoked the medical waivers for. It wasn't just me. It was an epidemic in the military. They were restructuring so we can get more guys to go, to, to get more of our young men to put together so they can go get killed in Iraq. And I'm not putting the military down, but that's a fact. They wanted more boots on the ground. They wanted more infantry. So they got rid of us middlemen, and that's what the military did. The DOD, re 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 they re organized us and put 15,000 families into a lot of tears that night, I can promise you. So um, that the first reason I came here, so because of the double devastating effects of two careers I strongly worked hard towards, and they strongly fell down with a big bang crash. Unbeknownst to me, it wasn't my fault. Um, it was nothing I could do about either one of them. And, uh, you know, and, and it, it, that's part of the gamble and the crapshoot when you strive for these things too, you know? But it, I just feel like there was something very unfair about that to me. Um, yes, I will finish it, you know, uh, I will get there. I'm gonna go back and do it, but I had to deal with my emotions and my devastation. Um, it's nine months I stayed strong, that's all I could do. I, I started losing it, I started getting high all the time again. I just went right back, boom. All, one day, 18 years clean, I need to take a hit. I woke up, sat up straight up in bed after 18 years and just said, I need a hit. That's it, that's how it happened. Drove right, I didn't, I, I, uh, I drove to Philly on 76. I had to ask directions on Kelly Drive, how did I get to the place where the drugs were? That's how I worded it, because I didn't even know. Oh, you mean North Philly? Oh, is that what it's called? Okay, okay, yeah. So that's how I got there. Um, I literally had to do that first. And let me tell you, the first night I got here, was uh, the second night I got here, my friend drove, yeah, something like that, my friend drove. Um, the first night I was like passed out in the car and he drove. And then I was so scared to be um, on Cambria Street and like in this area, I sat, I was so scared. I was ducked down in the back seat on the floor in a ball for an hour. Like that's how terrified I was to be here. I was like, I was shaking. I was like terrified. I was like, it was like a war zone to me. That's how different it is. But um, I have, 
learned a lot. I have done a lot. I've accomplished a lot thanks to Prevention Point, thanks to a lot of the great social workers, thanks to the programs that are implemented and the people that care, thanks to myself and my own work, um, to my self-acceptance, to the acceptance of others uh, around you, um, to uh, your own uh, ability to take care of yourself or lack thereof. And um, I will say this. Uh, I do not regret being here. I have a lot of work to do. Hey, um, one of the questions that uh, I'm supposed to be answering right now is what does it feel like to have a drug addiction? To have a drug addiction. Um, I'm all messed up right now. Yes, I am. I'm messed up. I'm high on dope too, fentanyl. I do not like trank. Trank, I don't like it. I don't believe in it. Um, <laughs> And it's this, it's not like I'm saying I don't believe in fairies, but um, tranquilizers, I mean, I don't know why you would get up out of bed in the morning only to get in your car and go spend 50 bucks to a drug dealer to get trank, which puts you to sleep. A tranquilizer is, it puts animals, horses, dogs, cats, sheep, pigs, whatever, to sleep. It puts you to sleep. Why anybody, I don't know who introduced the idea that trank, yeah, doing trank was supposed to be party fun, but uh, party fun is not like coming in and no, and I'm here to tell all you young people, please do not believe in the ideal that getting high, um, get a pass, uh, nodding out, which means falling asleep while you're standing up, that's called nodding out out here. Um, don't believe that going to sleep is the new phase or new fad for getting high and having fun. It is not. It is a ploy from drug dealers to get you it's a ploy from some drug dealers to get you to spend money, okay? Um, they realize that a certain audience likes it, so they profited off it. They're profiting off you and your idiocy, okay? So don't, like, why you would get up out of bed and go spend $50 only to pass out on a sidewalk or fall asleep on a sidewalk? And, you know, anyway, is beyond me. Why don't you just fucking stay in bed? What the hell? That's not partying and having fun. So the fentanyl that makes the endorphins rush like dope does, like coke does. You know, we got high and you party because you want to be up and alive and be with your friends or not with your friends or yourself. And you're all hanging out and you're, you're, you're animated and you're having fun. You feel good, your endorphins are kicking. You know, you don't have to do any work. You can be free to be yourself, it's be your personality. You know, it helps you like, uh, what was the question? What does it feel like to have a drug addiction? What does it feel? Okay, so I am addressing it. What it feels like to have a drug drug addiction is, um, you know, sometimes it feels really good, as I'm saying, to like be able to have those endorphins and party and hang with your friends and just be yourself. You know, you're being you. You know, you might be funny, you might be obnoxious, you might be a little quiet, like, you know, whatever it is, you're out with your buds and you're being you, and nobody's judging you for it. Everybody is kind of digging it. Like, oh, wow, they're like that, or, you know? But what really saddens and angers me is like seeing these women that are like this. It's, it's unladylike. I mean, this is what Trank does. That's what it is to be nodding out. No, you don't want that. Um, it is not cool. It is not ladylike. The men do not like seeing the women like that. I can tell you 150% to every woman out there, stop it. You look like a fucking idiot. You look disgusting. Um, it is just, the men are not looking at you with any kind of respect um, or, um, uh, they're not putting you down. I mean, I know they're feeling sorry for you. It's not like they hate you, but it's just like, why would a woman want to make herself look like that? And why do these, where is it that these women get this idea that it looks cool? What the fuck, man? No. And uh, so what it's like to have an addiction, it's a, it's, it's a job. You know, it's a, it's a lifestyle. You know, you accept it or you reject it. You get up and you go hustle for the money to get the drugs. You have to decide how much tolerance you want do you want to still be able to feel that high off a bag of dope? All right, well, keep your bags down to two a day, maybe three. If you don't give a shit, do your four bag shots and pass out and possibly never wake up because the half-life is three days. And if you build up, if you continue to build all this uh, fentanyl up in your system and opioid, and you, it, it suppresses the nervous system as a nurse, I would tell you that. Um, it makes you sleep, and the more you have in your body, and the less time you give your body to expunge it, to expel it, to get it out, to metabolize it, burn it up, whatever the fuck you want to call it, get to go through your pores, whether it be through your pores, your vagina, your penis, um, it comes out everywhere. It, it, it does, in its various forms. Your body wants that toxic shit out of your fucking system. It is kicking it out, it is screaming, get the fuck out through your pores and everything, you know, your sweat, your shedding, 
the meth makes you shed, you got the dope sick, you make you sweat, it's like grimy and oily and then the sun and you're sweating. And that's just the, you know, and the, and the toxins from the chemical breakdown of these substances is very, very, very damaging to your body, people. Okay, whether you know it or not, it's breaking your organs down, it's breaking your skin down, your tissues down, your bones down, your calcium, your hair, your skin, everything. You are falling apart whether you know it or not, okay? How well you took care of yourself up until that point is going to determine largely how you're going to look in the future. Um, so, you know, drink the water, get the toxins out, walk, you know. Yes, uh, your body wants to be humming, humming along and operational, you know, um, with everything functioning as it should, healthy and normally and, and with the proper nutrition and exercise and rest and water and hydration and, and that sort of thing. Along with that, we all know we have hormones and chemicals that run our body systems. Um, uh, by and large, the nervous system is the one that is most affected by the, by the drugs and by homeostasis. Um, because it is one that is, uh, it operates every other system. So if we have a chemical imbalance, if we have too much of something or too less of something, this is a whole other thing you're gonna have to have hours and hours for, so don't get me gonna get into it, I ain't doing it. Um, so the chemicals are either gonna be too much or too little. So um, the addiction comes in, why are we addicts? Or what, what makes us do this is that um, sometimes we just, have the, we, know, we know we need something to fix the, the imbalance in our operations that is currently going on at the moment. Like as we wake up, as we're walking, as we're speaking, as we're breathing, as we're standing here, as our normal body is, just is, okay? If, 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 if we need something to calm us down and we have too many chemicals making us act that way, we're going to go do that drug. That's why I said we have up people and we have down people. Yes, so I believe that the chemical, because chemical imbalances are part of our system, our body systems, um, they are a daily, um, our body produces these chemicals or lack of these, lack of production of these chemicals on a daily basis. So of course, these people as addicts are gonna need to make up for those lost chemicals or too many chemicals by using every day. And I strongly feel that as a disease that has been determined and diagnosed that um, I was skeptical about that at first I have thought about it more and certainly have pondered it this year um, my message to the world is this um, go easy on the addicts and don't be so negative and crit critical about putting them down I think alcohol is 50 times worse than any heroin or fucking cocaine and I will stand by my words every single day of my life Alcohol is way worse than any of these drugs. And I would not date an alcoholic man, but I will date a heroin user in a heartbeat. Um, my message to the world is this. Um, lighten up a little bit, back off a little bit. These people, once they are um, well into their addiction, they can handle themselves on it with, their, with what they need to get done during the day. They can get high and get that done. Um, getting high doesn't mean you have to act like an idiot. Maybe they, they could be do a shot of heroin and can be, you know, focused on their work and duties as a parent and as a worker with a stoic face and a ded dedicated body and, a, and an era, our professionalism and courtesy as much as they can be wild and crazy and complete, total like weirdos, you know. Um, it is up to them on the inside how they want to be on the outside. Um, it is absolutely something they can control, okay? Unless they're mentally ill, so my message to the world is this, part B, if they're mentally ill, they're using the drugs for their psychological disorders, and you have to uh, forgive them for that too. Um, I'm sure there are other reasons why. Um, my message to the world is to um, let's all work together to uh, forgive each other, not condemn these people. Let's work together to say, hey, that abandoned building would, be, would house 1,500 people. Let's get these people off the street. And there's a lot of great people out here handing out food. Thank you. My message to the world is thank you for your help, for your, for your support, for your forgiveness, for your acceptance and love of us addicts as people and human beings because I can tell you nobody out here hates you. Nobody out here has hate. We love each other. We care about our families. We care about our jobs. We want to work. Work. We just know we just aren't accepted as workers because of our habits. Um, we want to figure out ways to keep putting things back together with our addictions, with your help. Please don't yell at us, don't scream at us, don't don't ignore us, especially if you're friends or family. That's when we need you the most. Come and hug us and love us, and we will do the same. And and tell us, hey, you know what? We want to help you keep your job with your addiction. How can we do this? How are we going to do this? 
what is it that we're going to get done that we can still be a family and that we don't have to kick you out of the house that we can figure this out because you don't you don't kick family out of the house unless they're like psycho murderers or something you know whatever uh, that is your your sibling that is your brother your sister your mother your father your son your daughter whatever you love them as your husband and wife keep your family together don't let the drugs or the stereotypes break your family or your friends up you figure it out I can't believe the night they waste all we give in. But honestly, you've got to know that this ain't living. But we could run. And let it burn, let it burn You've got to know that nothing lasts forever